All right, now let's take a look at RAN, Right Ascension of the Ascending Node. Satellites may have identical eccentricities, semi-major axes, and inclinations, which are the E, A, and I values, but they may still be oriented differently in space. They can be rotated or twisted about the Earth in various ways. So this one is um, can be a little bit tricky. I want you to take a look at the Earth and note the word pen here. I can have a satellite in this particular orientation and remember the satellite is always doing this exact same thing in this exact plane I can have another satellite um, when the earth before the earth starts moving here before I actually start uh, start time I can have another satellite tilted over here and another one tilted you know over here they have the same inclination they have the same semi-major axes you notice I'm not changing the size of this um, they have the same eccentricities, but they're just sort of in different places around here, um, all at the, kind of the beginning of time. They're all in different places. So I have these four satellites here. Notice they have the, all the same eccentricities, semi-major axes, and inclinations, but they're sort of rotated around the Earth a little bit so that they're not on the exact same path. They do intersect. You can see that there's, um, you know, where those rings come together, there are points of intersection but they only intersect at one particular moment, and if they have a slightly different altitude, um, then they're really not at risk of uh, running into each other, as long as that's maintained. So that is right ascension of the ascending node, where they have the same um, E, A, and I, but they're just kind of rotated or twisted around the Earth. So um, taking a look at this, just watch this video here, and see if it makes a little bit more sense as you watch what's going on. Right ascension of the ascending node is the angle measured along the equatorial plane between a vector pointing to a fixed reference point in space. So um, the first point of Aries, that's the space that we are picking. Uh, we're just picking the a star that is we're calling fixed in space. Now, you know, I know the Earth moves around the sun, and so you're saying, well, that point in space is going to be, you know, different depending on where we are in you know, around the sun, but it's so far away that that point, um, that reference point is, you know, only going to give you fractions of a decimal away when you're calculating right ascension of the ascending node. So um, we use that point and the point on orbit where the orbital motion is from south to north across the equator. So this is called the ascending node. So if we look at this in our example here, and um, you can see here's the vernal equinox arrow pointing here. So the location that it is at, at the equator, and you can see this sort of green plane sticking out here, um, that location from this spot to this angle here, that's the RAN degree. So the blue one would go all the way along this green line, this faint green line over to right about here. And that's that point. It's not where the satellite is. It's kind of this intersection point here. And then the green satellite goes way over to here at this point. And it appears that these are each at approximately, um, what, 30 degree, in, yeah, and it shows it down here, 30 degree markings, each one of these um, degrees coming out of here. So we have it at zero degrees because it's going right through this pink one, the vernal equinox, and 30 degrees away from the yellow, 60 from the blue, and 90 from the green. So you're going to need to see some examples to uh, solidify this in your brain, I know, but this is just kind of the beginning of it. We also have argument of perigee. Orbits can have the same um, eccentricity, angle of inclination, which is I, semi-major axis, and ran, and still have different orientations around the Earth. If they have um, a specific eccentricity, um, you may have one like that's orbiting kind of here, and you may have one that's pointed sort of out here. So it's near to the Earth at different places. The argument of perigee describes the orientation of the orbit within the orbital plane. Like where is the apogee and where is the perigee? Where is the apogee, the place that is closest, and the perigee, the place that is farthest away? If we just change the argument of perigee over to here, then the apogee and perigee you can see are in different places, even though it has all of the same um, other conditions here. So it is measured as the angle from the ascending node to the perigee point in the direction of the satellite's motion. So this one, again, is quite tricky. Um, if you look at the orange one here, if we look at from the ascending node, so going out 
to the ascending node, so we're talking this direction towards here, um, to the perigee point, that's the direction that we're going, is that's where we're measuring the angle. So in this case, as we go out, we are at a zero degree plane, zero degrees here. Now, if we go down, then that's 90 degrees. As we go all the way around here, we're at 180, and we're going all the way around here is 270 degrees to the top. So again, this will take a little bit of practice, and you're going to have a simulator that you can sort of toy around with and play around with and modify and adjust all these things. And I strongly suggest you modify and play around with them enough so that you can get a better understanding of what all of these things are. And as you are playing around with that simulator, if you're still like, what the heck is argument of perigee and ran? Like, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Then that's when you need me, and I'll help you figure it out because um, I have a tennis ball and things. And... So I promise that I can help you understand this. True anomaly is the last piece. And this is basically after you, an orbit and its orientation have been thoroughly described using all of those other options um, or criteria, there has to be a way to describe where it is on that orbit. Where is my satellite exactly right now? And that is true anomaly. The true anomaly at, is where its location is at any given instant. So a true anomaly, again, is the angle between the perigee point and the satellite's location measured in the direction of the satellite's motion. And this value is constantly changing as the satellite moves in its orbit. True anomaly is 0 degrees, so this gives you a value, 0 degrees at perigee and 180 degrees at apogee. So if you want to know what the true anomaly is, you see where it is, and then just measure the angle from either perigee um, is 0 and apogee is 180. So you just measure where it is with respect to... Uh, basically with respect to perigee, the closest point to the Earth. So Keplerian elements in review. This would be a great time to just double check and note all these down. Make sure you have all these. There are two elements that describe the size and shape. They are eccentricity or eccentricity and semi-major axes. So those letters are E and A. So pause this, make sure you have that noted. There are three of these describe the orientation of orbit in space. You have inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, and argument of perigee. And one of these parameters of the Keplerian element set describes the location within the orbit at any given moment, and that is true anomaly. And that is um, identified with this little V uh, symbol here. And argument of perigee is this W. These are some Greek letters. We have the omega symbol here. So a timestamp referred to as an epoch must also be included when providing a Keplerian element set. This is so that it is known when the set of values was accurate for the satellite or when the snapshot of orbit was taken. So there are so many different factors. We can, we can tell exactly where it is based on true anomaly, but in order to know when it was there, that you have to know the epoch. And so, or the epoch, there are different ways that I've heard people pronounce this. Um, but that is your actual timestamp. It was there on June 1st, 2012 at... 10, 47, and 12 seconds a.m. And so then you have your epoch right there, your timestamp, and that's when it met this true anomaly value of a certain number of degrees in this argument of perigee under this right ascension of the ascending node at this particular inclination with the semi-major axis of this and eccentricity of this. So all of these parameters then can tell you exactly what that satellite is doing in that exact orbit. So here are Kepler's laws in review. We have first law, satellites will travel around Earth in elliptical paths with the center of Earth as one of the foci. That is Kepler's first law. So we've taken a look at all of this junk, and now we are throwing this last piece of hopefully clarification at you. Kepler's second law is a line drawn between Earth and a satellite will sweep out equal areas during equal time periods anywhere along the orbit. This one is really cool. So if you have a satellite way out here, remember it's going really slow out here. Remember from that Molnaya clip? Really, really slow. So in a time period of whatever this is, maybe this is 40 minutes. It'll be here 40 minutes later, it's here. If we find the area of this green slice, and then we compare here, in 40 minutes, it's going really fast on this side of the Earth as it whips around. It goes a big distance. We find the area of this slice. Those two areas are going to be exactly the same. So that is Kepler's second law. The line drawn between Earth and a satellite will sweep out equal areas 
during equal time periods anywhere along the orbit. And that's just going to show that it's moving slower here, but it's really far away. And it's moving fast here, but it's really close. So that's sort of what that is connecting. Um, so translated, this means the speed of a satellite changes as the distance between it and the Earth changes. At perigee, it's moving fastest, and at apogee, it's moving slowest. And Kepler's third law, the period of an orbit t is related to its semi-major axis a by this equation that you've already written down. So those are Kepler's three laws, and we had to kind of go through what the heck was happening um, before um, I listed them out. So hopefully now you've recorded down the three laws and you've recorded down the Keplerian elements.